All right. Now that we've had the first onslaught of attendees joining us, uh, once again, my name is Danielle Borgon. I'm the Education and Community Engagement Manager here at Paragon. I'm joined by Courtney Chung Lancaster, who's our Assistant AD, who helped me in creating this event. Um, we're so excited to have you all and to get to hear these wonderful playwrights talk with each other about such a really important and fascinating topic. Before we get started, um, I want to talk through a couple of things. The first is this is an online event, uh, which means that there's going to be internet hiccups. Um, it is really possible that things will freeze momentarily for you. It's really possible that mics might cut out or things like that. I want to invite everyone to take a breath through those internet hiccups and remember that we will all catch up with each other and that it is okay for things to go a little haywire on the internet. Take a moment to get yourself comfortable and settle in for this event. We want to make sure everyone's um, in a good space. For the next part, I'm going to do our land acknowledgement. I want to mention really quick that I am reading it. Uh, so you might see my eyes track on the side of my screen. That's because it's really um, crafted with the artists and, and the other people in the room. And I want to make sure I get it right. We want to acknowledge that we are gathering in many different places and in a much different way today. This medium often invites us to be disembodied and to not engage with where we physically are at any given moment. One way to disrupt this and counteract the colonial and capitalist ideologies we've inherited is to speak to the original and displaced caretakers of the lands that we are on. Please take a moment to root yourself, take a breath and reflect on these questions. A quick note that if your answer to any of the questions is I don't know, that's okay. Simply take a note to follow up on it following the event. We recommend using the resources native land.ca or whose land as a starting point for your learning, though it is not a final or definitive source. Please take a moment to think about where am I? What is the original or traditional name for this land? What nations are or were displaced so that I might reside here today? What, if any, treaties apply to this land? The presenters and facilitators today are joining you from three different locations across the country colonial known, colonially known as Canada. Each of us have our own relationship with this land and the nations of these places. We would like to acknowledge and thank the following nations for our presence on their ancestral lands. The Mi'kmaq, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Wendat, and the Silk. It's an important for us to note that the land of the Silk is unceded. Lastly, we want to acknowledge that there have often been nations and people who have cared for these lands that have gone unrecorded or unrecognized. We thank them as well today. I'm going to hand things over to Courtney to do our introductions to the artists. A reminder to try and keep yourself muted during the presentation um, and videos off for the moment. Courtney, over to you. Hi, folks. Um, hello from Mi'kma'ki. Uh, you might hear um, my little child in the background uh, making some noise. He's just woken up from a nap and he's hanging out with his dad and he's um, not super pleased at the moment, but I'm sure he'll cheer up shortly. Uh, it is my immense honor to introduce the two artists who are hosting this webinar here today. I am such a fan uh, of both of them and their work, both as performers and of course, as playwrights. Uh, I'm going to pull up their bio so that I don't miss any important details. Um, First, I'll introduce Jeff Ho. Jeff is the uh, recipient of the Bullmash Siegel Award and is an OAC playwright in residence at Tarragon Theatre. And he's a Toronto-based theatre artist originally from Hong Kong. His works include the critically acclaimed Iphigenia and the Furies on Torian Land, which was produced by Sega Collective and which won a Toronto Theatre Critics Award for Best New Canadian Play. 
His other plays include Antigone Fong, produced by Young People's Theatre, and Trace, produced by Factory Theatre and Be Current Performing Arts, which was also remounted at the NAC. It's a, a stunning solo show um, that I want to highlight because he wrote, composed, and performed it. It included remarkable piano performances. Um, Jeff has held residencies currently with Tarragon Theatre, with Stratford Festival, Night Swimming, Cahoots, Banff, and Factory Theatre. And um, I also want to highlight the fact that he's uh, won the John Kaplan Legacy Award for a Young Canadian Playwright um, and is a graduate of the National Theatre School. So Jeff, uh, can I welcome you to turn on your video and join me? It's nice day to be able to turn on your video after the bio so that you don't have to sit there and just sort of nod while I say things about your remarkable career. <laughs> but Thanks. hang tight, now you get to make uh, facial expressions while I introduce your colleague, Serena Parmar. Uh, Serena is a remarkable actor and playwright, originally from Kelowna, BC. She's now based in Toronto and is also an acting graduate from the National Theatre School and the Birmingham Conservatory of Classical Theatre at Stratford Festival. It's so fun to, to, to note, even in these bios, the connections between the two of you. The two of you go back eh, from both NTS and then now this connection, having both won at one point the Bull Nash Siegel Award at Tarragon Theatre. I think it's really cool. Uh, her first remarkable, daring, full-length play, The Orchard, after Chekhov, premiered at the Shaw Festival in 2018, making Parmar the first South Asian playwright produced in the festival's history. The play went on to a second production of the Arts Club Theatre in Vancouver, and The Orchard, after Chekhov, is also taught on syllabi at universities across Canada and the USA. Serena's plays have been developed by Cahoots Theatre, Soul Pepper, and Diaspora Dialogues and she was also a participant of Stratford's Playwrights Retreat and a recipient of the Elliot Hayes Playwright Development Fund awarded by the Stratford Festival. She's currently working on her next play, also as a playwright in residence at Tarragon Theatre, where she is the current recipient of the Bull Nash Siegel Award. So Serena, uh, if you want to turn on your video. Hello. Hi, you two. Um, so uh, I'm shortly going to turn off my uh, video and but I, before I do that I just want to mention that we are hoping to collect questions from all of the attendees uh, while Jeff and Serena have a chat with each other. Um, if you note at the bottom of your Zoom screen there's a little icon that says Q&A and if you click on that you'll be able to add some questions. Uh, feel free to add questions at any point throughout the webinar and once we have about 15 minutes left in our hour um, Danielle will pop back on and we'll uh, offer up some of those questions to Serena and to Jeff. Um, so once again, I invite you to add questions uh, by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. All right, you two, can I leave you to it? Okay, thank you so much once again for doing this. Jeff and Serena, everybody. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, Serena. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Jeff. Oh, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, to start it off, Serena, I just wanted to touch base. Courtney sort of really highlighted how we both had a background in terms of uh, training at NTS as actors. And I just wanted to sort of explore what's our relationship with the classics as playwrights or as performers? What's your original experiences with the classics? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of Shakespeare growing up in the Okanagan, which is, uh, I'm here right now on the traditional and unceded territory of the Silux people. Um, and so, I had a lot of Shakespeare growing up. And then when I went to NTS, I think similar to you, we did a lot of Chekhov and Ibsen and more Shakespeare. And so really saturated in the Western classical canon. Um, and, you know, I always liked the muscularity of the text and the kind of complexity of the stories, but um, it, it, I don't know how you felt like there's always a tension there, right? Like I see myself in the stories because human experiences are universal, but I'm a step outside of them because, you know, they're set in places where we wouldn't traditionally inhabit, although we have been many places, my South Asian people for a long time. But yeah, I don't know. How, how did you feel? Because you went to NTS. Yeah, yeah. Very similarly. Um, I think we chatted briefly about this, but uh, we did three sisters every single year of my time at NTS and oftentimes playing the same characters all three years, but with different directors and different adaptations and texts. And that felt like a real insight because some adaptations just really worked. Like you mentioned, the muscularity of the language or sometimes it just felt musty and academic, but had a different insight 
around the Russianness or the con historical context. So it was all really informative, but also similar questions, like very aware that I am not playing these characters authentically as written originally, but what does that even mean? Who has the right to perform these parts? You know, um, and when did you start shifting that mindset of sort of acting in lots of Shakespeare into thinking about adapting something like Chekhov? Well, I was at NTS and we did Three Sisters too when I was in my second year. <laughs> then in my third year, we did The Cherry Orchard and I played Dunyasha. And, you know, we kind of did it. It was pretty standard, you know, production. Um, Jason Byrne directed us in it. And then, you know, graduated and forgot about it. And um, then about a year after I graduated, my mom had called. I grew up on an orchard in the Okanagan. And she called to say, we cut down the orchard. And I thought, oh my God, that's what that plays about. It's the closing of a family chapter and the end of an era and the beginning of something completely new and the, and the end of a family legacy. Um, Cause my family, we've been farmers for many generations back in Punjab. And so when I made that connection, I was like, oh, wow. Like, it's just so interesting that that connection never occurred to me when I was doing the play in school because it was just never framed that way. Right. Even though I grew up on a farm, I grew up on an orchard and <laughs> this play is set on an orchard. And I never, like, I don't even recall ever thinking about my childhood while we did that production. You know what right. I mean? Like, it's so strange. I was thinking about the aristocracy and Russian revolution and, Anyway, so when I made that connection, I, it made me excited to kind of re-envision it so that people could see that we do belong in all of these stories. Right. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know Jason Byrne directed Your Three Sisters. Yeah. I mean, that uh, for, for everybody, he, uh, Scottish, Irish, Scottish, I, Irish. He's an Irish director that has a very, very interesting process. Uh, fascinating. I, did any of that sort of work with Jason Byrne and his hyper naturalism, did that ever influence some of your playwriting? That's a good question. I think some of the characterizations, I definitely had my classmates in my head when I, you know, was doing my first pass okay. of the play because that was my first introduction to the story. So I could see how that character moved in their body and, and the kind of rhythm of their voices and, and things like that. But right. what was your, like, I've seen your Iphigenia, which was so brilliant. And what was your in to that play? Like, because you didn't do it before. Right? Like, you'd never been in it. No, any yeah. Um, my, both the adaptations I've worked on have been the Greeks. And both were commissioned, sort of set off by somebody else's impetus and idea. With the Young People's Theatre, they wanted to reframe Antigone and set it with the young people as sort of the lead of the action. And with Iphigenia, it was Jonathan Sinan, who um, is a dear, dear mutual friend, uh, who said, I had this brilliant idea. I have two actors, Virgilia Griffiths and Thomas Olajide, as the core siblings, Iphigenia and Orestes, and I want to have this play. And he actually asked if I could play the Orestes in the production, but I, I couldn't. Um, and so I offered, could I adapt it? coming off of the Antigone. And so we embarked on a really rapid six month period process from August till December of writing the play and then putting it up the January afterwards. Um, it was very, very, very rapid. Uh, but the way in was through these conversations. It was somebody else's inspiration. And then I had absorbed everything in terms of what was given to me and then finding my way in, in terms of reflecting then into my questions in the world, what I was watching on TV, the language that I was really interested in exploring it with. Um, and the core questioning that I did with that adaptation was just why again? Why again? And as a bit broader question of why do the classics again, either as adaptations or when we just do them through their, you know, original texts or, you know. Well, yeah. because the question that I got a lot and, and thought about a lot was like, why not just write a new play? Yeah. Well, like I think that ties into why even revisit these stories. Is that something that came up in your conversations when you were working on these? Like, let's just, we have all these cool ideas. Let's kind of just follow a basic idea of Iphigenia, um, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. But off. Sometimes the question would be, okay, you veered off from the adaptation to the point. For Antigone, for example, I made, um, what's his name right now? Oh gosh, Creon. <laughs> My partner just screamed out Creon for me. Uh, he, um, I made Creon the father because I wanted to explore filial piety between the family. Uh, and without Oedipus there, I made sure that I 
clocked it like that so that um, Antigone had a more tense relationship, especially in the Chinese cultural contexts of the play. Um, with Iphigenia, and at some point with those both those adaptations, when I veered off and made those more drastic changes, the question will often be, why not just create a new play with these family dynamics that you're exploring? Why not use that as the point of departure? But there was something about holding on to the skeleton of those original texts um, and still feeling incredibly free in terms of radically changing the structure of it or the story near the end or characterizations. There, there was something in response to this original text that is still fresh and new. It feels like a new, if, when working on an adaptation, I'm sure you feel like it sometimes too. It's like writing a new play basically. Yeah, because I don't know about you, like I was looking at bringing new relationships and themes to the forefront that were maybe just a passing in the original, but really resonated with me and I thought would resonate with, you know, folks today. So yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Absolutely. In Iphigenia, there's uh, Orestes and Pilates, who in the original texts were um, cousins in that family, those Greek family trees. They're cousins, but all through history and statues and other sort of representations of their relationship. It was always about platonic love and or veering into exploration about homosexuality. And so that was sanitized all through different modern adaptations from different other academics or adapters. And so I just wanted to bring it back and I made them unabashed lovers, you know, and I really had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. Well, I, get, I remember that relationship. It stuck out, it felt like one of the strongest relationships in the play when I saw it, just because, suddenly you saw a whole other side to this world that's like you're saying often so sanitized and um not as uh I don't know it just doesn't seem as relevant to our, our very our everyday right. lives you know right yeah absolutely yeah. in the same vein how much have your collaborators influenced your development path in your adaptations oh and mine hopped around a lot so it was so funny we had talked about this when we had first spoken that he wrote Iphigenia and developed it within six months and the orchard took six years. <laughs> so wow. it went through a lot of different um, homes and hands and, and uh, brains and hearts on it. So it started at Cahoots with um, Nina Lee Aquino and then Marjorie Chan when she became AD there and then went to Soul Pepper and Guillermo Verdecchia, um, worked on it quite a bit. So, you know, they all gave the different things the play needed at, at different stages. Like when I was first starting. And I want to ask you too, how you start your adaptations. Like I did a very strict mm. line by line right. adaptations. I had about three um, translations that I was working with and uh, I just wanted to recontextualize the piece and kind of put it into a vernacular that sounds contemporary to us. Um, and so that was kind of the first like pass of the play. And Nina at the time was really encouraging of um, trying to find my point of view as a South Asian uh, artist and farmer and and how can that start to infiltrate the text and it was very small at first and then grew and grew and grew and um, then by the time I got to Guillermo that kind of like you know meeting was over so there was quite a bit of South Asian perspective in it and I felt pretty successful at recontextualizing the original and keeping the um, integrity of the original and so Guillermo was really great at going through and and looking at like technical things like is there um I don't know subtext missing or is there exposition missing and and people can't come along for for the ride because you know I've missed a step in the storytelling so yeah but it, it, I never had just one person the whole time where we jammed on ideas and then out of that came the adaptation right but that's yeah. so interesting all the layers that were built and all the different collaborators like with Nina's great focus on teasing out the cultural specificity, it went through so many layers of growth. That's amazing. I mean, six years is an excellent time frame for a new play. You know what I mean? For any play. Yeah. Well, Antigone I had four years. So like a much more normal seeming time frame of just developing a new work and going through the workshops and, you know, that process. Yeah. Well, I think it's so interesting too, because you know, Iphigenia was like a one act, right? It ran. Yes, it was very, like 65 minutes, 70 minutes, yeah. yeah. So it's just interesting that the development process mirrors the, the final product, you know? It was like kind Absolutely. Then frenzied, fast and furious, 60 minutes, like full tilt kind of thing. And, you know, 
the orchard after checkup ended up being, you know, two and a half hours and, and very slow and very quiet. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, I don't know, it's an interesting thing, process, timelines. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you had asked, I do, I did do one line by line sort of um, trans positions from the original or you know other translations of Antigone but with the Iphigenia with that experience I sort of just read many copies I uh, with the Greeks I often go to Anne Carson just because her language and her muscularity and the poetry and the sheer beauty of her words is often a great inspiration and then I go off really academic ones that are really dry but then I get to see the meaning of the words. And I did do a line by line for the Antigone, but with the Iphigenia, after absorbing the sort of skeleton and the structure of it, I just sort of churned it all out as quickly as I could. Um, and then the rewrite and workshop process was about configuring you know, the relationships and the structure of it and the break. What I ultimately did with Iphigenia was that halfway through the play that was different from the original is that the chorus speaks up rather than supporting the siblings to flee uh, Taurus. Uh, in this play, the chorus speaks up and fights back and sort of hinders their process, ultimately failing, but sort of reversing the ending so that it becomes a huge question. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and what would you say are the pros and cons of like, because you've kind of done adaptation two different ways. One where you just kind yeah. of absorb everything and go for it. And another yeah. one where it's, it's much more um, deliberate line by line. Do you want to talk about what was yeah. different there? I feel like uh, ultimately if and when I embark on a new adaptation now, it would be a great balance of both mm -hmm. to try to do um, a lot of just absorbing. It's, you know, it's reading and reading, reading essays, reading really um, researched materials and watching things. Like part of the fun of these classics is there's always some YouTube version of them at the Royal Shakespeare Company or something like that. And they're all speaking really uppity. And then you're like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Or yeah, that's really awesome. Um, and with the line by lines, it just, it's absorbed in a different way. It's a lot more patient. It's a lot more sort of intellectual in some ways. And there's, uh, there's some great space and great possibilities from that. And then the instinct rush, that's also great because that feels like a just right from the now, right from the here um, and catch it while you can feeling. And so to have a balance of both, setting myself up with parameters so that I can launch into just that vomit draft with a lot of research, that would be something I think I would continue exploring in the future. I feel like that's so much about trust too, hey? Like, yeah. I could never quite dive off. I mean, and two, it took six years because it's my right. first play. So right. I was learning to write at the same time, but um, it, it took a long time for me to trust that the research and how well I knew the story was in my body. Yeah. That it would just come out in um, a way that still you know, told the story authentically and, and also had my perspective in it. Yeah. But I remember watching, I was just thinking this morning, I watched a film adaptation of The Cherry Orchard. So it, it wasn't like a stage. <laughs> well, this could be so tedious. It wasn't a stage production, do you know what I mean? It, it was like set in a house and, and people walking in and out. And um, what's interesting though with those film adaptations is like you can't do the text as it's written in the play, any translation of it, because it's too much, it's too heavy and film dialogue just doesn't work like that. So it was interesting to see what um, that writer and, and director like chose to distill, like which moments they kept and which moments they thought could be done in a look. And sometimes it would help illuminate a certain relationship between two people that I wouldn't have seen just reading it on the page because it was in between, like so much of the checkoff is subtext. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like that silence between those two characters but I didn't clock when I read it. Right. Actually, this about the relationship. And then I can go and write a little half scene about it or try and incorporate that dynamic into the relationship for the whole play. That's so interesting. What What's your process of filtering what you feel is important to keep or amplify in your adaptations? And what do you feel a lot of liberty of just saying goodbye to? Yeah, I had a hard time saying goodbye to things. Guillermo was great mm. for that, actually, because right. he was like, just, it's, you can't say everything in one play. I was like, yes, yeah. but you're right. Um, because I so much wanted to, you know, like kind of honor the, the original text is the right word, but, but I wanted it to stay 
as uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I wanted it to keep its integrity, I guess, so that when folks did get to do the play, they felt like they were still doing a checkoff, checkoff, mm. however right. you define that, um, so that it gave BIPOC folks a chance to tackle this work in a way that felt really meaningful and resonant to them because it was talking through a cultural lens that hopefully they felt more connected to. So I had a hard time letting go of um, of some things, but in terms of adding things, I mean, I think similar to the, like what you were talking about, like it's a, just a gut feeling. You're like, oh, I see a connection there mm -hmm. that I don't think other people are seeing, you know? So I wanna <clears throat> put that in there. So in the original Varya is um, always talked about as a nun. She's like, like Varya, why do you look like a nun? And it's kind of a dig that she like looks very right. matronly and like can't get a guy. And, and it said, just said in passing, said, okay, this, this person has a relationship with religion. And so in the adaptation, I had Barbara, a very devout Sikh, um, Barminder is her like given name, start to um, transition and convert into Presbyterianism. Mm -hmm. So because I saw that happen, at least to my mom's generation when I was growing up, uh, living in Kelowna, and it's a fairly white, um, was a fairly white community. So you know what I mean? You just kind of get a spark and go with it. And if it starts to take over the play, then yeah shrink shrink because it's well sure. there's like same i guess in the greeks like there's so many characters it can become Absolutely. a movie if everyone gets like a big arc and and drama and dilemmas and all that kind of stuff so yeah. yeah that's you just spoke to something that i'm so curious about around the crunchiness of oftentimes the uh i'm just gonna say it, the whiteness of these classics yeah. how do you contend with that like what are your questions or how do you challenge those or what's your way in or around those things? Yeah. I feel like, I'm interested to hear your answer too, actually. Yeah. The, I feel like the crunchiest thing that I can't solve will either be the ticket out to like make it wonderful or like the downfall of everything. So like when I was thinking about the orchard, like in the original, this air, um, uh, this family from the aristocracy, like they're, they're gonna lose their orchard because they decide to do nothing. They won't do anything to save it. And so it falls into foreclosure. And like culturally, I couldn't rec reconcile like an immigrant family, a South Asian family doing nothing to save their orchard as first generation immigrants to this country. Like you would do everything because you have no safety net and you came here to work hard. And it's just like goes against the grain of everything. And so that took a long time to to figure out and like you know I could have just made them wealthy coming over so that maybe they have a different relationship to work and money and losing money but it just didn't feel authentic to the South Asian farmers that I know in in Canada and in the Okanagan and and so finally I found again we talk about little passing notes in the original um Grisha drowned the the youngest son of the family drowned when he was seven and so in Russia at that time it's probably not a big deal like to die under eight years old is kind of common. Medicine was different, child rearing was different, but to lose a child of that age in the seventies is devastating. So I use that as a catalyst to start to break the family apart and why they weren't able to function as a team anymore so that this orchard starts to fall in disrepair because of emotional reasons and right. try as they might, they try everything, 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 which is like the yeah. exact opposite of what the family in the Russian original does. Yeah. Just doesn't work out, which is, again, the same kind of tragedy we're losing. So wow. yeah, but that was kind of my way. And how about you? How do you kind of reconcile with the oh. this and the whiteness of? Well, I think it stems back from those questions we first talked about, about acting like all through school. Um, I remember working on the Shakespeare's, uh, some of the most difficult in terms of identity and in terms of training, it really felt like at times I was evaluated based on how well I could be, play white. Um, and so it's always been something that's been creeping in. But as an actor, you just go for the job, you try to work everywhere you can. And it was only it wasn't only it was only until I was a playwright when I was like, wait, I can just grapple with it here. And so with the Antigone, 
it, when they offered Antigone to me, I just thought for a long, long time, it took six months to even just think about it until um, the experience of my time in Hong Kong during the umbrella protests in 2015, 2016, um, and settling that alongside Tiananmen Square. It felt to me that there's a lot of missing voices and or just straight up disappeared Chinese citizens due to Tiananmen Square that's still silenced to this day. And that Antigone attempting to bury her brother at the square is very much an alive story even now. And that the umbrella protest in 2016 is a continued evolution of that growth of China's dominance. And so I put all of that into adapting Antigone. It felt like the skeleton of that story also fit this exact curiosity and questioning I had in the world. And it was a joy to write an Antigone where I've had some new students say to me, I'm using, I, because you know, for theater school, you have to audition with a classical and then a contemporary monologue. And some um, younger Chinese artists have said, I've been able to find a Chinese Antigone now. And that's given me such great joy to know that I'm able to um, grapple with these huge questions of identity while also maintaining an interest in these classics because I do love them ultimately. And so it's in finding that love, but also contending with that crunchiness that I feel like just took a long time to work at. And there's still lots of things I would want to fix. I'm sure that's all, with all, every playwright and every play, there are things I would love to make more specific as current news about China has grown and evolved into its state now. But I get to investigate these questions of identity in a way that is not interpretive as an actor. It really becomes imaginative and creative in a way that I can just try and throw things at a wall and have lovely collaborators and other actors grapple with those things. <laughs> but you put it in the foundation, you know, so it like vibrates differently. Yeah. And, and what you're saying, I, yeah, I agree with so much. Like for me too, it was just about kind of pushing against and putting out the press release that these stories belong to all of us. Like right. if you're gonna make us study these stories in theater school then I want them to belong to me and resonate with me and, and mean things that are deeply personal to me the same way they might to my white um, counterparts and colleagues and stuff like that in school. And I think human experience can be so universal that that is absolutely possible if we take the time to adapt them with, I don't know, courage and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that story of Antigone, you adapting it. There must be a deep love for what you we're, we write and that love can often then be like frustration and anger and you know like impatience and all those things but ultimately with these adaptations i feel like starting from a point of really love might not be the right word but real real curiosity and real interest about why this story again and why now again yeah. did you find with the time and the process that it took to grow to the Shaw that you just spoke about the press release, were there conversations about having to explain why it's been adapted, adapted with cultural specificity? Um, I mean, I think not when I was creating it, like all, okay. all the places that housed the play over the years and the Diaspora Dallas was also a huge, um, a huge supporter and, and I want to shout them out as well. Like never a question for them, but I think, um, audience members when you go into certain institutions that are used to seeing a play done a specific way with specific looking people um mm -hmm. they have memories of that they they feel they have ownership over that and so i think that can be a complicated you know, to put it kindly a complicated relationship for them you know so right. you know, we'd have people say things like oh you're adapting a checkup good luck you know like wink wink like right <laughs> probably fail aka um and, you know, like some people would like, you know, watch because it was in the round so we could see them. Some people would watch with their arms crossed the whole time and not clap at the end. And most people quite <gasps> did, you know. Wow. But that's, again, I think that's kind of an exciting thing too is like, at least for the orchard, being of the length that it is and the size of cast that it is, 12 people, it can only be done at certain places that yes. have a lot of money and um, an audience that likes to see you know, those kind of Western classical canon plays. And so um, I always felt like it's a really op uh, a great opportunity to educate them and kind of just like bridge them over to maybe seeing more diverse people, diverse stories on stage. Cause you're taking something that's familiar and just kind of tipping it on its head. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna have their journey of 
fighting through that or accepting that or having whatever feeling they have about that. But I always used to joke, it's like, well, once you bought the ticket and you're in the theater, like you're trapped, like at least until intermission. So like, <laughs> just give me a chance and just see how you feel. And if you didn't like it at the end, that's okay. But it made me happy that they experienced it. And then we had like great folks come. I remember the most moving story was um, we had a, an elderly Sikh couple come and they were sitting in the front row and the gentleman was turbaned and his wife was beside him. And Sikhs, we all wear a car, which is like a steel bracelet. And uh, it's one of our articles of faith. So if you see someone wearing it, you know, okay, you're Sikh too. If I need anything, I can reach out to you. Um, and so there's a speech about it in the play and uh, it's kind of after a racist incident happens and the family's quite shaken and uh, the grandfather character explains and that's why we wear the kara. And the gentleman in the audience who also had his car just kind of lightly touched his and just said, yeah. And that was just like, you know, what more can you ask for? And you know, when my mom sighed, she's like, oh, you were listening the whole time. Like for people to be seen in spaces that are prestigious and well endowed and considered to have value like I think it just makes a big it's a big deal so. that's so beautiful thank you for sharing that's so yeah. profound yeah that the cultural specificity does also you you're completely right there's a familiarity and sort of the culture about some of these stories like you know and at the same time being able to bridge and share these stories to audiences that may not have felt, like you said, ownership about it or see themselves in it. And to be able to say you belong here too is something quite profound. With Antigone, there were students who, because it, you know, it was young people's theater. So it was a lot of high school students and, you know, <laughs> very reckless and great audiences. But there were also just, I could see in Chinese students' faces who during the Q&A would bring up stories from their family and some of them having emig emigrated from China or Hong Kong for political reasons and that they were able to voice that while also listening in and learning a little bit about what this Greek play was. And that made it feel like there was a purpose for why it was done again and done, you know, two years ago now, but, you know, relatively now, yeah. So interesting because eh? I think the other thing to wrestle with is like we're talking about one side of the conversation which is adapting western canon plays the classics right but like there's this whole other side which is like we could adapt plays from India and China and like all over the world like the global majority parts of yeah. the world anyways which is, I just wanted to put that out into the yes <laughs> well like there's a whole other side to this conversation and really just absolutely and and, you know. Totally. Thank you for saying that, because that has been a personal goal in terms of, wow, why do I know so much more about Eurocentric classics than of my own culture, yeah. of the Cantonese canon? Yeah. And I feel like there's some work to do to also in myself to look at possibly adapting some of those stories for and bridge that gap the other way around for some of these other audiences. Yeah. So much. Yeah, thank you for sharing. It's yeah, such a beautiful story. How do you feel that it's different from working on a new play now, now that you're embarking on? Oh yeah, yes, I'm writing my first uh, first play without um, like uh, an original play. Um, it's funny, hey, because I've never had to invent a plot before. So I really have been like going slow and taking my time to really learn and understand story structure and um, the construction of plot and Right. So that feels like the slow and steady work that I was used to with adapting the portrait because I would go line by line. And then there's this whole freeing thing of like, I can just say whatever I want, whenever I want, typity type. And like the characters just say, it. I don't have to worry if it's how it's complimenting or going against the original. And yeah, and that's kind of freeing. Oh, what question I had for you actually, I think we have five yeah. minutes left, but I wanted to ask this before we left is like, how did you wrestle with like these original texts are spoken so formally, like they're written in very formal English, at least in the translations that, the more like dry translations, right? Yes. Um, so how did you find or figure out how the characters would sound in a either contemporary setting or just in a more updated 
vernacular. Do you know, like? Totally, absolutely. It was a process. With the Antigone, it remained a little bit sort of like formal uh, or poetic. But with the Iphigenia, because of that experience, I was like, oh, it still feels stuffy. I'm still continuing with the stuffiness. And that was my own doing. But with the Iphigenia, I was just watching a lot of Veep at the time this comedy from HBO, everyone should watch it. Uh, and there's just so, it's so crass and it's such great comedy. And Iphigenia, thankfully, was penned originally by Euripides. So it was genre bending. It was a comedy that then had like real sentimental and or tragic scenes. And so I just felt a great freedom in that genre bending to say, oh my God, I'm going to just adapt and have these people swear a lot or say the most crass and or, uh, modern ways of speaking and still be able to tell the exact same story or still be able to drop into that same gravity of any situation, but with just a much more casual way. The freedom of shifting language while keeping the core of a scene, that feels important. You can articulate it any given way really in an adaptation, as long as you, and you can also change the core of that scene too, but the language of how it's articulated, oh my gosh, that's the fun. That's the new play development side of it, I feel. Well, something I really appreciated too about your Iphigenia is it felt really muscular, which is something I associate with, you know, the kind right, of more like right. traditional um, ways of speaking, but, but very unbridled. Like even the sexuality in it between the two um, guys, you know, like it, it just felt like it was like bursting out of the seams. So I think, yeah, anyways. It's just so interesting how we get there because I know with the checkoff it's like he speaks in very long yes. sentences that go around in a circle in a circle and maybe repeats one more time and I wanted to keep that um, kind of style of speaking like that rhetoric but updated so trying to figure out why farmers would go on <laughs> for a long time and speak in longer sentences because we're yeah. speaking in very short sentences now was um yeah, anyways, that was an interesting journey too. And I, I feel the same as you did with Antigone, which is, oh, mm. still a teensy bit stuffy. Right. Me at least, but I don't know if it actually reads that way, but it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Serena, for this great chat. Oh, I think, ah. are we into the thing thing now? The, yeah. Somebody asked, what do you mean by muscular language? Let's start with that. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Um, oh, such a feeling. Do you want to try or should I try first? <laughs> uh, go ahead, Serena. I'll try. I'll try. Uh, what do I mean by that? I think there's just like a, like a, like a compact poeticism to it that I guess I associate with like a muscle. Like there's no, even though it can feel rambly, it doesn't feel like there's, um, a lot of extra, everything seems so tightly knit together. So that's what I mean by it. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a feeling, but yeah. Yeah, totally. I feel like I, I get a sense of it more from the actor's perspective of when I do something like Shakespeare, it literally muscularly works the muscles more in a way that it the high stakes of it or the high emotions of it also engages the body in a way that classical theater often does and in contemporary theater often has a much more like you know naturalistic sense whereas the poetry and or the length of the lines feels muscular in that sense for me danielle uh there's a few other questions coming in uh Claire had asked about, because both of you mentioned that there were uh, non-Anglo-Saxon or like non-white or Western texts that you might want to adapt. Um, and she was wondering if you have specific examples of stories um, from your own culture that you might be interested in adapting. I mean, and this is from very limited knowledge, the, the little I know of um, Indian um, theater and arts is they don't have, they don't do storytelling in theater in the way that we do. Like we have a script with a four X structure and people act it out with their bodies in a naturalistic way. And um, in India, it's just, you know, we have epic poems like Tagore, like, um, 
can be done in a theatrical manner. There's things like Bharatanatyam, which is like a dance form of storytelling. So, I mean, that's another really interesting conversation and thing is like, even the process of adapting something, say from India, you would also be taking it from one art form to another essentially, because the way that we understand a play in the West, just to my knowledge, doesn't um, have a history in, um, in India, like a long history, yeah. That's such a great point, Serena. The form of theater itself, like globally, and what we perceive here in Canada, really specifically, is so different. We have we're so text heavy as a city. It's different, like city by city here in this country. And in China, for me, I would love to look at some of the cultural propaganda operas. During the Cultural Revolution, Mao had banned every other play or opera other than a few curated ones that really serve the Communist Party's propaganda. I would love to adapt those operas both in the form of it um, and to just investigate what propaganda looks like now. Uh, Aria asked, how far do you allow yourself to veer off of the original text? What was your line and did you go past it? Um, I had I had written a few new scenes in the um, adaptation. And for me, it was a great compliment when people couldn't tell that they were there. There's two, three new scenes in it. Um, because it, for me, it felt like I really captured the, um, the, the subtext and the tone Jacobian style of speaking and storytelling. Um, for me, it always came back to what was I trying to investigate with the original? And if the new scene investigated that same thing, then I would try and keep it in unless structurally it didn't make sense. And then where I veered completely, completely off is there's interludes between each act and there's they kind of like these dreamscape um, little sections and they're done in voiceover and they're usually very like warm and um, like viscerally um, good feeling emotional memories uh, that the family has of the orchard. And that was a huge departure. Um, but for me, I wanted a way for the audience to just experience some joy and a break, which I think is a, a bit more, maybe a, because I'm very a nice person, but it seemed like a more contemporary style of storytelling than Chekhov that kept it so suppressed. All the subtext was only longing and a lot of losing. And I just wanted a few moments where we could see them winning. So, yeah. That's so great. Um, absolutely. I don't think there's a line at all. There's, you know, for myself, I've adapted and stayed close to scenes when it felt useful. And then I completely veered off and changed an ending of a play entirely because that was the purpose of it with the team and the company that I was working with and the artists. Um, and then there are adaptations out in the world and Octoroon is one that I'm thinking of by Brendan Jacob Jenkins, where it really changes and recontextualizes the entire play. And so that line, I feel, is set by yourself, um, depending on what you feel is useful to keep or not to keep. Um, the next question is from Christopher and he asked as playwright and or viewer, how does one determine what is a meaningful adaptation or empty or even harmful appropriation? It's, a, it's not a light one. So take yeah. your time. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. Thank you so much for asking that, Christopher. Um, there's no answer is really my answer in that it's so contextual and specific to every single audience, every single show, what the company is, what the venue is, in what city, in what language. Uh, there are too many cultural contexts to say. Um, I have to pull up the thing again, but I want to at least offer things to think about is, you know, how does one determine what is meaningful? Ultimately, I can't prescribe that into an audience. Some audiences slept through my adaptations and some audiences were riveted, like any play and like any audience. And so that meaning is completely set by yourself. If you find an adaptation or a source material that you feel is meaningful for you to adapt, that is already the reason to do it. Whether it becomes harmful or not seems like a question that revol would really sit with a core group of collaborators or um, questioning between yourself and the world and news and uh, people that you may be writing about and communities. There's lots of resources and consultation these days to make sure things are not harmful appropriation, but also to not let that stop you from writing and finding the meaning you're wishing to write through the adaptation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, 
Robin, I think she was meaning it's like, it is, it's up to the individual audience member. It's up to the playwright. If it's meaningful, you never know what's going to resonate with someone and, and move them. I think in terms of harm and cult cultural appropriation, one thing I like to think about is, um, am I trying to write about a community or an experience that um, is marginalized or a minority? It's not in the majority of the setting that I'm in. So in Canada, that would be Black, Indigenous. Um, you could also look at people of color. Um, and if I'm coming from a more majority group, there is harm that can happen there. So how can I have meaningful consultation and be ready to hear no, be ready to hear from that community, yeah, this is not a good idea and to humbly say thank you very much and find a new idea. Um, and and also if it feels like the collaboration is meaningful and the community is, is giving the go ahead um, to make sure that it's um, a two way street in terms of give and take. So you're gonna be um, using their stories uh, and, and using um, characters from that community possibly or um, something like that. And so how can you make sure you give back to that community in, in some kind of way that's meaningful? So the exchange is two way and not just uh, a, a majority group taking from a, a minority group. But I think Jeff is so right. Like every single situation is so unique and, and different and, and it's a really complex, um, it's a really complex area. So I just say, you know, lead with generosity, humility, kindness. Yeah, and be ready for someone to say no too. Mm -hmm. that would uh, someone's asked why we should keep adapting and performing classics instead of writing new plays. I wanted to bring it into the room because we had a really great discussion about what the difference is between an adaptation and a new play and is there a difference? So I thought I'd offer that up here. Adaptations for me are new plays because they're taking something that has existed in many forms across time and is in conversation with something that pre-exists but is updated for the now. And updated might not be the right word, but it's brought again, brought up again now for a reason, either prescribed by the author or a company or chosen by a select group of artists to explore this again. Um, why? Some people love it, then that's a great reason. There's something to question again because this play hasn't been done in a while, but it still exists from you know a specific canon. And in the process of making it a new play, you get to speak about it with audiences now. You're not speaking to audiences from 500 years ago. You're speaking to them now, but using similar stories and similar structures or similar questionings and updated through a different way to reinvestigate those similar things. And also writers do both and beyond. You know, playwrights write for TV and film and also write new plays and then can also adapt plays. So it becomes a huge question of why do you choose to adapt that specific play for now? Not about, not, it's not for me about why not? Why should we just do new plays? It's about why can't we do it all? And why can't we all belong it at all? I think similarly, it's a follow your heart situation. You know, if adaptations are calling you, if there's a story that you feel like has a song in your heart, then adapt it. And hmm. you know, there's there's got to be, I think, equal room for adaptations and and new plays. And I think sometimes it gets into tricky territory when something is adapted from a classic that's like a reputable and has prestige or or, or whatever these things we connote with a, a classic Western adaptation. And that play is getting more resources, more funding, more uh, promotion than a new play. And I think that's a, a balance that should be investigated and, and made equitable. Um, but I think there's room for both. Um. The last question I have here says, how do you think these classics can be taught without feeling exclusionary against non-white students in theater schools? Yeah, that's not the million dollar question, huh? <laughs> I, I feel mean, like, yeah. please Serena, please. No, no, go, please go. Um, it, I haven't been in school for years. Um, so I really see, have seen a change in curriculum that makes me really hopeful in terms of you know faculty that reflects more uh, intersectional identities and also yeah these also new faculties selecting repertoire or from adaptations that are more intercultural um, 
So there is a way to still teach Shakespeare, but investigate maybe how they've been done around the world globally or how different directors of different races have found their way in. Um, my most exciting and one of my favorite artistic experiences as an actor is with Ravi Jain in his Prince Hamlet, where I played Ophelia. And the entire cast was gender swapped. We used ability and sign language as a way to investigate uh, this story and to retell it. And the why not, as he's the artistic director of Why Not Theater, the why not of it really blew all of my expectations and understanding of how I see myself and my identity with these old things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's two ways to, again, like a multi-pronged attack, right? One is how can we break open these um, Western classics, either through re-envisioning how they're um, uh, produced, you know, gender swapping, different abilities, or by adapting them and, and putting in a new perspective or a cultural component. Um, so I think that's one side of it. And then I think the other side of it, I don't know, for me, when I was in theater school, it was like the, the Western canon when we were learning classics was very, very misweighted. So it was like 90, 95% of what we were learning as classic was from Europe. And then they would throw in a Tagore or a Lorca or something. Um, and, you know, if you take a step back and look at the world, the global majority actually exists in Africa, Asia, South America. So how can we start to really look at the word classic? Let's just pretend classic means anything from 1850 to 1950 and look at that from a global perspective instead of from a Eurocentric perspective. I think that would also help invite more people into the conversation. And, and I think to allow that there might always be friction there between artists and students, like you may never want to even engage with those plays. And I think there's room for that. No one should if they don't want to, you know? Thank you. I just think you're so right, Serena. Uh, it made rejog sort of the friction, making space for that friction is already very different from my experience of being taught Shakespeare. You know, to do this the way that I'm teaching you means you'll be employable in the future with sort of the sense at theater school. And the space for the friction was that suppress it so that you can fit in. But making space for friction and to really let that be open in learning about these texts um, will already help in terms of making feel people letting people feel more included into these plays and then everything that serena said yeah well i think too leaning into that friction is going to tell us where to go next like i'm so excited to see where the next generation coming out of theater school feeling yeah. this friction how they activate it and change how we do classics if we do classics you know like um instead of what you're saying it's that's so well articulated suppressing it I want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. It's been such a lovely afternoon. Um, I want to thank especially Jeff and Serena for your time and your uh, incredible thoughts and amazing questions to help open everyone's brain up to this really, really great topic. Have a great rest of your December afternoon, um, or for those watching the recording, whatever part of the day it is for you. Uh, thanks again, and we hope you have a great holiday season, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>